I'm going to read 19 to 23, and then I'm going to flip over to 1 Corinthians 15. Our topic is Christian civil government. Christian civil government. And a longer title would be Toward a Reformed Understanding of Christian Civil Government and the Establishment Principle. Christ is king over the nations, and our job as believers, as Christians, as a church, is to disciple all the nations and tell every nation covenants with Jesus Christ, and every nation is a Christian nation. So today we're going to look at the why, and we've discussed the why uh, in the past in, uh, a few, on a few occasions, so we're going to be brief, and then next week we're going to look more at the how. But I'm going to read... 19 to 23 in Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and all. And then just briefly from 1 Corinthians 15. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. And I'll just stop there. The point being that Christ is king right now. He's not a future king in the millennium, a future millennium. <clears throat> he is presently king. And he is subduing all nations unto himself. In this study, we're going to advocate what has historically been called the establishment principle. And that is the teaching that the civil rulers in their official capacity are obligated to subject themselves to Jesus Christ and as far lies within their God-ordained sphere of authority are to do what they can to promote the interest of the true Christian religion. The establishment principle. In this study we will examine three important areas. And we'll get to the first two today, Lord willing. First, we will note that some form of an establishment of religion is inescapable. Okay? Every state has an establishment of religion, whether they know it or not, and we'll see why. And we'll also make a brief mention of dispensational, pluralistic, or uh, secular concepts. Second, we'll briefly consider the proofs for the necessity of Christians seeking an explicitly Christian civil government. We'll be brief because I've discussed this at least twice in the past 10 years. And then third, we will look at how Scripture carefully defines the civil magistrate's role in a Christian state or a Christian commonwealth. And this I haven't really discussed much in the past, so we're going to go into much more depth on this third topic, which will begin next week. Here we're going to look at some of the views of the establishment principle that are unscriptural or come to conclusions that go beyond biblical teaching. Okay, there are forms of the establishment principle that are taught by quite orthodox people Presbyterian, in Presbyterian circles that are statist, that are not rooted in an exegesis of scripture, but are rooted in human traditions. And we'll look at those. So let's look at our first major point. The establishment principle is inescapable. <clears throat> when we discuss the civil magistrate in religion, it is important to know that every nation has some kind of an establishment of religion, including the United States. Some states are clear and self-conscious in this regard, such as Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. These are all Islamic states, and they're explicitly Islamic states. Uh, when you become the Prime Minister of uh, Pakistan, for example, you have to swear on the Quran uh, to uphold their Unitarian concept of Allah, and so forth. And you have to uphold Islam. 
Their supreme authority is the Quran, and their law systems are essentially Islamic to one degree or another. Other nations, such as the United States, also hold to an establishment of religion, but are not honest or self-aware of their position. The view that is set forth in government schools, universities, colleges, courts, and governmental agencies is that the United States government is purely neutral with regard to religion. Hey, we don't take a position. We don't favor any other one religion over another. We're purely neutral. And that we've erected a wall of separation between the state and all forms of religion. That it is a secular, pragmatic state that does not take any position on religion one way or the other. That's the, that's the official position of the United States, at least the modern United States. The original position of, uh, of the Constitution was that the federal government didn't take a position, but that each state would have its own establishment of religion. Some would be Episcopal, some would be Presbyterian, uh, some would be uh, Congregational. And uh, the vast majority of states had a Trinitarian oath to be serve in office. But that's long gone, especially since 19, uh, March of 1948, when uh, the Supreme Court ruled that all public schools must not teach any form of religion whatsoever. <clears throat> now, if one defines religion in terms of the worship of a god, some type of deity, and certain religious ceremonies, one can understand the ignorance that's out there, that's prevalent. But we have to understand that religion is truly universal and that one's ultimate view of reality, and especially the source of, source of ethics and law, reveals one's God or ultimate source of authority. In this sense, everybody's religious. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody believes that ethics come from somewhere. Everybody has an ultimate view of reality, and whatever that view of reality is, whether you call it philosophy or religion, it is a religion. <clears throat> For the Muslim, it's Allah and the Quran. For the consistent Christian, it's Jesus Christ, Jehovah, the triune God in the Bible, the Word of God. For the Buddhist, it's Buddha. For the secular humanist, it is man or humanity. And here's the classic statement uh, by Rush Dooney, Institutes of Biblical Law. It's a fantastic statement. And I, the first chapter of Institutes of Biblical Law has more profound statements in it than any uh, modern book I can think of. <clears throat> and he says this, quote, No disestablishment of religion as such is possible in any society. A church can be disestablished, and a particular religion can be supplanted by another. But the change is simply to another religion. Since the foundations of law are inescapably religious, no society exists without a religious foundation or without a law system which codifies the morality of its religion. End of quote. That's page five. Now with the older humanism, there was a claim of objectivity with regard to the source of law and that it was held that morals or ethics are out there. Can you get this, and this comes from Greek thinking, that they had to think, well, where do ethics come from? They were very clever philosophers, much more clever than modern philosophers. They said, well, we have to have a foundation of ethics, don't we? So they posited that there's this realm of ideals that exists independently of their concept of God or the deity, and it's from this independent source of ideals that is objective demand that we get ethics. And they posited there's an ideal chair, there's an ideal table, there's an ideal tree in this realm of ideals. And that's where ethics come from. And so they could claim, well, we believe in objective ethics. <clears throat> they are out there either in nature or in the realm of ideals that was discernible through human reason. It was a law system founded upon human autonomy, which supposedly discovered objective law. Okay, so it's out there. And how is it discovered? Not by revelation, but by human autonomy. The human use of reason. Now, modern humanism does not even attempt to hide behind 
and artificial objectivity in that it holds that law is purely positivistic and subjective. It's arbitrary if you read modern law uh, theory. Men and women simply determine what they believe is right or wrong for themselves. And these are not these laws are not absolutes, but they can they can change and they can evolve over time as human opinions change. Thus, they can say, well, yeah, 50 years ago, homosexuality was considered disgusting and evil, but today we're more enlightened, and we think homosexuality is virtuous, you see. Or 50 years ago, abortion was considered murder, and people who committed abortion would be arrested. Ah, but now we're more enlightened, and we believe women have the right to choose to be able to murder their children, or they would put it that way, but to kill the fetus, the lump of tissue, which they define as a fetus, which is actually a human life. Thus, in the United States, right and wrong is determined by the Supreme Court, ultimately, who in turn often simply follows the prevailing views of society. And if you've ever read a modern Supreme Court decision, they're uh, fascinating in how absurd and stupid they are. For example, liberal court justices making a decision and saying, well, we appeal to what Europe has done. Europe has kind of gone in this direction, and therefore we appeal to Europe as our authority. Well, that's quite arbitrary, isn't it? It is important to recognize that the establishment of a religion is inescapable for two reasons. First, this recognition eliminates the myth of neutrality regarding a purely secular government that has crippled evangelical and reformed thought and action in America for generations. You can talk to Baptists, and I have, and you can even talk to reformed people, and I have, and they'll insist that we have got to stick to the Constitution as it now is written. I like our Constitution. It needs some changes. It needs to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and the, the triune God of Scripture uh, as uh, the only true God. <clears throat> but uh, it's critical reform people because they insist that this neutrality exists and they insist that this is the proper way to go, that we must avoid the wars of religion of the past and so forth and give everybody, quote, freedom. And most professing Christians in the United States hold up the U.S. Constitution almost as a divinely inspired document. Now, whether you think that the Constitution of the United States was defective from the beginning, or whether one holds that it was basically a Christian document that was twisted and hijacked by secular humanists, that's the majority view of evangelicals. It was a great Christian document, and then in the late 1800s and 20th century especially, it was hijacked and taken over by humanists. <clears throat> The Supreme Court banned all Christian religious instruction from the public schools nationwide in the spring of 1948. Prior to this decision, by the way, all the Christian schools throughout the United States, virtually all of them had Christian instruction now. Virtually every one. And then, of course, uh, prayer was banned in 1964. Whatever, one must admit that on the federal level, it does not recognize Jesus Christ as Lord. And the Bible is the ultimate source of law, justice, and ethics. One could say that it contained a serious internal defect that was easy to exploit by anti-Christian intellectuals as our nation apostatized and moved away from the Christian worldview toward a faith in supposedly objective science. Yes, the original Constitution was defective because one thing nations need to do by covenant is to be very clear and explicit on these things because of the sinful nature of man uh, taking advantage of defects. We have to explicitly acknowledge Jesus Christ as King, as God, as Lord, as Savior in our federal government, in our Constitution, and we must explicitly acknowledge the, the Bible as the inspired, infallible, inerrant a word of God, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament. That is very important and necessary. Second, it teaches us that a consistent Christian establishment must follow a Christian law system. Okay, if there's no neutrality, you have to follow something. And whatever you follow, whatever your basis for your view of reality is going to be your God, well then what, what must we follow? If there's no neutrality, we have to follow Jesus Christ and the Bible and the word of God. This would involve a form of uh, national covenanting with Christ and a submission to Jesus as Lord. 
to submit to God and Christ on a national level would involve the adoption of, of biblical law and the rejection of autonomous or humanistic law. It would mean the rejection of natural law as sufficient or even superior, that is the so-called law of nations, in favor of a detailed exegesis and application of revealed law, biblical law. And this point is crucial because natural law is not perspicuous. Because of sin and the fall. They were all fallen. And it is only used by Paul in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 2, verse 15, to prove that people are guilty of sin and do not have special revelation. That's all it's used for. Paul's not arguing that we can use natural law, but the, the work of law written on the heart is a uh, for social theory for running nations. <clears throat> And it cannot teach or say anything that is not already in special revelation. As if God has two laws that contradict each other. One in nature and one in special revelation. They have to teach the same thing anyway. So people who object to using special revelation, and they, Christians who do this, and then they fall back on natural law, are being quite inconsistent because we don't have two gods. We have one God. We have one law. Whether you get that law out of nature or you get that law out of special revelation, it has to teach the same thing ethically. So... Natural law is not designed by God to be a source of ethics or law for God's people independent of divine revelation. It has nothing substantial to say about judicial penalties, and it does not distinguish between sins that have no penalty attached and sins that are also crimes. In other words, we need special revelation to have a just, equitable law system that pleases God, that glorifies Jesus Christ. Other than that, you have a hit-and-miss system. This means that when Christians argue that our Christian civil government must remain neutral to religion and that they want a moral America but not a Christian America, they have unwittingly sided with secular humanists. And that's one reason that Christendom is so weak in the United States today and why there are so many professing Christians yet they have so little impact. Because they don't believe, they don't really believe that the Bible should be our source of authority when it comes to the civil magistrate and civil laws. So we find them siding with atheists and secular humanists and sodomites, even though they purport to be quite conservative. When the dispensationalist argues that the whole Old Testament law has been abrogated, and there are no blueprints from Scripture to run society, they have sided with anti-Christian humanists. When the pre- or all-millennialist argues that the Bible is only concerned with the personal piety and affairs of the visible church. They have ignorantly sided with the enemy. If believers are to be a salt and light of the civil magistrate, they must abandon pagan concepts of neutrality. So that's a very important point. Now, uh, just a side note here. People of a reformed persuasion who are not in favor of a Christian establishment or the adoption of biblical law are fond of quoting Calvin's rejection of the unqualified subordination of the state's law to the law of Moses. Now, of course, he was speaking against Anabaptists who were including ceremonial laws and laws that had nothing to do with the moral law. So that quote, the quote of Calvin from the Institutes, by the way, is always used in an illegitimate way anyway. While there is an element of truth to such thinking, Calvin, in his treatment of ethics and civil magistrate, uh, not only speaks openly of the great superiority of special revelation, but also repeatedly appeals to biblical laws, yes, even the moral case laws, for his source of logic, truth, and light. <clears throat> you know, it, it's interesting, you read uh, whether Melanchthon or Luther or Busser or Calvin, Yes, they talk about natural law theory quite a bit, but they always go back to, when they talk about how to deal with society and what to do, they fall back on special revelation, including the case laws, because that's where the specifics are. As August Lang uh, said in, after a lengthy discussion of Calvin's view of natural law, he says this, quote, Indeed, in a difficulty, in order to strengthen his view that marriage with a brother's widow is opposed to the Mosaic law, and therefore forbidden for Christians too, 
Calvin has recourse also to the communis uh, gentium, whereby, however, he means nothing more than the natura, honestly, I, I should have translated these Latin quotes, which declares that it is a, uh, rejects such marriages as illegitimate. Similarly, he places the law of Moses and the uh, communis is gentium, side by side, still another difficulty about the marriage laws. In other words, he's talking about laws of consanguinity and stuff, and he keeps falling back in the Mosaic law. Further utterances of that kind, however, have not come to my notice in my search in the writings of Calvin for the point now under discussion. Everywhere else in the treatment of usury and of the right of uh, civil authority or the duty of obedience even to tyrannical rulers and the like, natural law is passed over without a word. Most convincing, however, is the above-mentioned closing chapter of the uh, Institutes. Here the reformer in his discussion about the civil authority and the constitution of the state, about legislation and the position of the subjects, offers in his way a politics. But in so doing, he never deserts the method which he employs throughout the whole of the Institutes, a method which is based upon scripture and the analogy of faith, or in this case also, upon the revealed moral law confirmed by the natural equity. This method he does not sacrifice at a single point for the benefit of a general ethical ratio sinization. Certainly not for natural law theories of any description. End of quote. And then just one more quote from Francois Wendell, the, the great French uh, Calvin scholar, considered to be one of the greatest modern scholars on Calvin. He concludes thus <clears throat> in his teachings on this topic on natural law. Quote, Calvin expended a great deal of skill in presenting a coherent doctrine of natural law, which was an attempt to reconcile the Pauline text with the definitions of the Roman jurists. He's talking about the early Roman writers in the Roman Empire. And he did, no doubt, partly succeed in this by distinguishing between the application of the natural law and the political life and its function in the human conscience. Yet one cannot help feeling that this element in his theology is somewhat of a foreign body, assimilable to it only with difficulty, and that its existence alongside the divine law that is expressed in the Decalogue is hardly justifiable. So it seems, at least, to those who have received some knowledge of the revealed law. In other words, after all this trying to harmonize the Bible with natural law, uh, his conclusion is, is that, well, it's really kind of a, it's really unnecessary if you have revealed law. law. Why, why even mess with this? Well, you have to understand Calvin and the early reformers, you have to understand that they're following the medieval mindset there to a degree. <clears throat> Number two and I'll be brief on this, biblical proofs of the duty of establishing an explicitly Christian civil government. The biblical evidence that God requires all believers to work and pray for an explicitly Christian civil government is overwhelming. There are a number of solid biblical reasons. First, the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me, Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 5, 7, is a universal moral requirement of all mankind. Okay, it's not a commandment solely for the Jews. Now, if the first commandment is demanded of all mankind, it is also demanded of governors, judges, civil rulers, and even local politicians. It's required of everybody. <clears throat> Therefore, to allow the open practice of idolatry or to set up the state as man's God, the supreme lawgiver, is obviously unbiblical and offensive to Jehovah. Okay, to turn the state into God, which is what secular humanism does, is highly offensive. In addition, we should note the first commandment is the foundation of all subsequent moral and civil law. If there is no living, true God of Scripture who is transcendent and who reveals absolute unchanging moral truths to mankind, then one forms of government or ethic is meaningless and arbitrary anyway. So the first commandment is really foundational to all the laws that proceed, and it's really foundational to the whole Bible. Second, the law itself in Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 8 teaches that Israel was to be a salt and light, a living witness to the surrounding pagan nations of the benefits of God's revelation by their faithfulness to the civil law code. Or we should say their faithfulness to the, more specifically, to the moral requirements of the civil code. <clears throat> the moral law, including the moral case laws, forbids idolatry, pluralism, and secular humanism. This means that if America wants to be a shining example to other nations, that it must abandon secular humanism and pluralism, embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, and follow biblical law as closely as possible. 
That's the only way to be an example to other nations. <clears throat> By rejecting the establishment of biblical, a Bible-believing, genuine Christianity for secular humanism, America has done the exact opposite. As a nation, we're an example of darkness to the other surrounding nations. Abortion, feminism, sodomite rights, no-fault divorce, rank materialism, hedonism, fiat money, gross political corruption, and a form of statist fascism. The Muslim nations, for example, look at America and they see the great Satan. Now we have open sodomites, open sodomites serving in the military. That is not an example of righteousness. That is not an example of what Jesus Christ can do for a people. It's the exact opposite. And so what we want to do now is a, is a wicked nation is import secular humanism and pluralism to the Muslim nations and to all these other nations. And when the Muslims adopt democracy, and they all vote to become more Muslim and persecute Christians, well, isn't that the right according to the American system? Which, by the way, is not supposed to be a democracy. Third, in the Law of the Prophets, Jehovah makes it perfectly clear that he brings severe judgment on the non-Jewish peoples and nations who grossly violate his moral laws. You just read, for example, Deuteronomy 18, Jeremiah 46, and Jeremiah 48 and 50. And 51. Nations are brought into complete judgment and destruction for habitual violating moral case laws out of the judicial laws of Israel. That's, that's particularly clear in Deuteronomy 18, where you have a list. Here's, a, here's a, a list of things relating to sexual immorality, uh, adultery, incest, fornication, and all these, the homosexuality, bestiality, all these things. And then God says, it is for these exact reasons that I'm destroying the seven Canaanite nations before you. So there is no neutrality, and God doesn't care whether you believe in pluralism or not. He requires you to obey his moral laws. Fourth, the Great Commission implies that the church is to keep preaching the gospel and teaching the whole counsel of God until every nation becomes a Christian nation. Quite obvious. In the Great Commission, the apostles and their successors throughout history are commanded to disciple all nations by teaching them to observe all things that Christ has commanded. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. The all things that Christ has commanded is inclusive of the whole Bible, the 66 books of the Old New Testament. Because Jesus Christ very uh, clearly endorsed the whole Bible as the Word of God. The basis of this command is the fact that Jesus is a divine human mediator, has received all authority over heaven and earth as a result of his redemptive obedience. Okay? Now, obviously, as, as God, he always had this, but as the theanthropic mediator, the divine human mediator, he gets this as a reward. As Peter said in the day of Pentecost, Acts 2.36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now he's given them a reason why they need to bow the knee to Jesus. And if you study the book of Acts, by the way, the Lordship of Christ is emphasized far more than even him being the Savior. So this idea, well, yeah, he's a Savior. He's going to be Lord someday in the future. Uh, that's completely foreign to the New Testament. What all this means is that the victory of the cross and the empty tomb applies not only to salvation and the sanctification of individual people, and that's crucial, but it also is to be applied, proclaimed and applied to all areas of life. In other words, the gospel is to be preached, churches established, and the whole counsel of God is taught so that the Savior's Lordship will extend to education, the arts, economics, politics, civil law, and so on. So, that, for example, if we were a Christian nation, we would have a Christian Supreme Court where every single one of those men swore on the Bible 
that they believed in Jesus Christ. They were all members in good standing of a Reformed Bible-believing church. They all were Trinitarians. They all believed that God's moral law is the foundation of law. And we wouldn't have a, uh, lesbians and perverts on the Supreme Court. And people that were clearly evil and wicked. The Lordship of Christ is comprehensive. Therefore, the church's job of discipleship is comprehensive. Okay, it extends to kings. And Paul preached to people in Caesar's household. And whenever Paul appeared before a king, like Felix, you need to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. And he trembled at the gospel. And then fifth, the Bible teaches explicitly that all civil magistrates have a moral obligation to serve Jesus Christ as king. Psalm 2, 10 to 12. <clears throat> now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Now, after speaking of the exaltation of Jesus Christ, in verses 6 through 9. <clears throat> the psalmist warns civil magistrates of their duty toward him and the danger of disregarding his kingship. Okay, this is a psalm about essentially what happens after the resurrection of Christ. What is to happen? This service must be rendered with humility, reverence, and sincerity. The president, king, or prime minister must obey God's word in his own life and promote the cause of Christ within his own realm of responsibility. That's what this is teaching. And other passages indicate that a time is coming when the Christian nations will be the norm. Psalm 72, 11 to 12. All kings shall fall down and worship before him. All nations will serve him. Isaiah 60, verse 3. Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. So obviously then, civil magistrates who ignore the Lordship of Christ, who ignore Christ's holy law, and they promote arbitrary humanistic law, are in open rebellion against him. And what did Psalm 2 warn? Civil magistrates who do that are heading toward judgment and destruction. Now we have this great economic crisis in the world right now, especially Europe and America, Canada and so forth. Do we deserve it? Yes. Will it get you worse? Probably. Will there be warfare? Probably. Yes. We deserve it. For our nations have abandoned the Lord Jesus Christ and his holy law, and they've spit on the Bible. When a nation legalizes sodomite rights, when a nation legalizes the right to murder your own baby, when a nation exalts homosexuals, that nation is on the path to destruction. And the only thing that's kept it from being completely destroyed is the fact that there are a lot of Christians in it. So the very people that our leaders hate, and the, the media hates, and the secular humanists hate, are the very people that are keeping them alive. <laughs> it's kind of ironic. <clears throat> and then sixth, the Bible teaches that the Savior's reign involves a progressive subduing of his enemies in history. Paul said, 1 Corinthians 15, 25, that Christ must reign till he puts all enemies under his feet. Here's what Charles Hodge writes. He must reign until the purpose for which he was invested with universal dominion is accomplished. As in Psalm 110, it is said to the Messiah, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Christ is to put down all authority, rule, and power, verse 24. And he reigns until he has accomplished that work. By subduing, however, is not meant destroying or banishing out of existence. The passage does not teach that Christ is to reign until all evil is banished from the universe. Satan is said to be subdued when deprived of his power to injure the people of God. And evil in like manner is subdued when it is restrained within the limits of the kingdom of darkness. End of quote. So Christ is subduing his enemies progressively throughout history. 
This idea that's common among evangelicals that Christ died on the cross so you could witness to people and pluck a few people from the fire here and there, that's a very, very limited false understanding of Christ's dominion. The Philippians, Paul wrote this, 2, 9 to 11. Therefore, this comes after a lengthy description of his suffering on the cross, his humiliation. So Christ died on the cross, he was humiliated. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Jesus Christ is Lord. Matthew Henry says, the whole creation must be in subjection to him. Every nation and language should publicly own the universal empire of the exalted redeemer. This is the clear teaching of scripture. How people could, could, could deny this is beyond me. To the Ephesians, Paul wrote, this is 1, 20 to 22. He raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So, the all things placed under his regal authority clearly includes the nations. Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Germany, France, Italy, the United States. The nations are all to Jesus Christ, and this involves promoting the interest of the church, Paul says. They're to promote the interests of the church, not fight against the church. A few days ago, there was some special, I heard it on Christian radio, there was some special prayer day all of the United States for young people or something. <coughs> and they made a ruling that uh, teachers were not, if a teacher, I forget who it was, if a teacher wanted to pray, he could hide from the students and pray where they couldn't see him, but he was not allowed to pray with the students because that would violate the separation of church and state. Our nation is so evil. It, our nation is so evil, it's unbelievable. The civil ruler is to do all to the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10.31, and acknowledge that Christ is the ruler over the kings of the earth, Revelation 1.5. When we look at these passages, we see that the idea that Christ's kingship awaits the second coming, a very popular view, or that the exalted Savior is only king of the church or of Christians, okay, that's what Billy Graham taught when he preached after the 9-11 attacks, he would quote the New Testament and he'd say, well, that only applies to you Christians out there. No, it applies to everybody. <clears throat> it is wrong, or the idea that it is wrong to mix true religion and politics, all these are clearly unscriptural. Jesus is Lord over lords and king over kings right now. Right now. This is a fundamental aspect of gospel preaching. If you don't preach the Lordship of Christ, you're not preaching the true gospel. Because it's an aspect of his resurrection and his exaltation. Next time you read the book of Acts, read, when you read the book of Acts, look at the sermons of the apostles. They're not saying, well, Jesus died for your sins, uh, accept Jesus in your heart. They're saying, Jesus Christ has been exalted. He's the Lord. God commands all men everywhere to repent. It's very different than the way people preach today. Well, let's turn our attention now to the civil magistrate's role in a Christian nation. Having just demonstrated that civil magistrates cannot remain neutral with regard to religion, that an establishment of religion is inescapable, and that all rulers and nations have a moral obligation to bow the knee to Christ and adopt Orthodox Christianity in their realms, 
We'll now turn our attention to how this is to be carried out. We're just going to touch on this. We'll get into it next week. Now, as we discuss a Christian state, we want to make it perfectly clear that a Christian nation can only come into being through the preaching of the gospel, the planting of churches, personal evangelism, and discipling communities in local congregations. The Bible teaches that the gospel is to uh, season society like salt or permeate society or the world like yeast in a lump of dough. There's nothing in scripture about using force or coercion or revolution. And that's Islam. That's Marxism. Marxist-Leninism. That has nothing to do with the Bible. So let's make this perfectly clear. When we advocate a Christian society, we're not advocating revolution. We're not advocating taking up arms. We're not advocating force. After the majority of people in the land voluntarily embrace Jesus Christ and seek to apply scripture to all areas of life, what are they going to do? They're going to elect Christian leaders. And they're going to elect people who say, look, if you elect me, we're going to institute biblical law. We're going to get rid of the secular humanistic laws. We're going to get rid of abortion. We're going to get rid of sodomite rights. We're going to get rid of uh, sex perverts in the military and women in the military things that violate scripture, and we're going to go back to biblical law. They're going to elect Christian leaders and believing judges who will implement a Christian law order. Trinitarian Orthodox Christianity will become the official religion of the land by covenanting. They will have to uh, add an amendment to the Constitution and we'll have to make it amendment number one in capital letters, Jesus Christ is Lord over this land. And we acknowledge the Bible as his holy word. And we submit ourselves to the Bible. You can't vote if you're not a Christian. You can't serve on a jury if you're not a Christian. You can't be elected to office if you're not a Christian. That's what we would have to do if we were consistently and explicitly a Christian nation. In Saudi Arabia and in Pakistan, they don't let Christians serve in the government. They don't. In fact, if you convert to Christ, you might end up dead. You might get your head cut off. <clears throat> All secular humanistic laws will be abandoned because they contradict scripture and are evil. Laws that legalize infanticide or child murder, for example. Laws that legalize the practice of homosexuality, lesbianism, cross-dressing, and sex change procedures. Laws that allow uh, central banks to print fiat money and steal from the population through inflation. All these things are spoken about in scripture. The Bible has a lot to say about these kind of things. And it's truth, it's wisdom. In other words, once Christianity becomes the predominant religion in the land, and serious Christians are elected to office, <clears throat> how should they rule? Okay, we've talked about the why, and the why is pretty clear cut. How? What is their standard? For the Bible believing Christian, this question should be easy. The infallible Word of God tells us how civil leaders should rule and what is the only true unchanging foundation for the rule of law. To prove this statement and learn what the Bible has to say about godly rule, we will examine the following areas. Number one, the doctrine of sola scriptura. Contrary to modern evangelicalism and much of modern reform thought, the doctrine of sola scriptura has consequences far beyond worship. Far beyond worship. Yeah, Deuteronomy 12.32 is talking in the, in the context of worship there. Don't add anything to it, don't detract from it. You look at Deuteronomy 4.2. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 
It's talking about ethics primarily. It's talking about life in general. Ethical principles. And then two, the Old Testament laws regarding kingship. Okay, we're going to look at that next week when we look at Deuteronomy 17. And then three, examples of godly kings. And then four, the state as a nursing mother to the church. A passage that's been greatly misunderstood and mis misinterpreted uh, by both theonomists and by old-fashioned establishment principle people that turn it into statism and socialism. Well, let's look at Sola Scriptura on the state. The Bible teaches that Scripture, the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, is the final definitive authority in all matters of faith and life. It is the only absolute objective standard by which ethics, doctrine, church government, and worship are to be judged. Okay, and I could quote the Westminster Standards, I could quote the Helvetic, I could quote the Belgian Confession, I could quote the Heidelberg, you name it. This is simple, old-fashioned, Reformed thought. It is inspired, sufficient, and perfect. Consequently, it is a perfect and complete guide, not only for everything God requires us to believe, our doctrine, our salvation, and so forth, but also for everything regarding how mankind is supposed to live. Ethical laws are principles for sanctification and for determining civil laws. Okay, it's the foundation of all ethics. As Dan Till says so brilliantly, uh, <clears throat> 1955, Defense of the Faith. Quote, thus the Bible as the infallible, infallibly inspired revelation of God to sinful man stands before us as that light in terms of which all the facts of the created universe must be interpreted. All of finite existence, natural and redemptive, functions in relation to one all-inclusive plan that is in the mind of God. Whatever insight man is to have and do this pattern of acti the activity of God, he must attain by looking at all his objects of research in the light of Scripture. And then he quotes Calvin. If true religion is to beam upon us, our principle must be that it is necessary to begin with heavenly teaching and that it is impossible for any man to obtain even the minutest portion of right and sound doctrine without being a disciple of Scripture. End of quote. Now, while it is certainly true that Paul talks about the work of the law written upon the heart, a man's being, Romans 2.15, he does so not to advocate natural law as an independent source of ethics. That's, what pe that's where people take it. That's not what he's talking about. <clears throat> or as a supplement to written revelation, but to prove the universality of sin. Look at the context. Men can argue about different theories of natural law, and have had endless debates about different conclusions regarding ethical principles from nature. There's all sorts of views. There's a Roman Catholic view. There's a view of the Greeks. There's a view of the Latin, the Roman scholars. There's the early Middle Ages and late Middle Ages. There's all these different views about natural law and so forth. <clears throat> all kinds of debates. But they cannot disagree or debate regarding the ethical teachings of Scripture, which are perspicuous. without deceiving themselves or committing sin. The Bible is not vague about ethics. It's clear about ethics. All ethical questions relating to nature and the state can never be interpreted rightly or truly understood from the perspectives of motive and the why behind why we must behave a certain way without the light of Scripture. Okay, it's our foundation. It's our foundation. Only it tells us fully and clearly what we must do. And only it gives us valid, solid, true reasons why behavior must be a certain way. Anybody can say something is right or wrong. But scripture, only scripture gives us reasons why something is right or wrong. Okay, all ethical principles derive from God. They're based on his nature and character. That's why they're absolute. That's why they're unchanging. That's why we have to obey them or there's severe consequences. <clears throat> Without the absolute unchanging ethics of scripture laws, systems are arbitrary and or changing. Without the teaching of the Bible, there can be no genuine rule of law. You always hear these 
liberal, satanic congressmen and senators get up there, we believe in the rule of law. We're getting rid of Gaddafi because we believe in the rule of law and all this kind of stuff. Well, they pass one law and then they pass another law that contradicts it just a few years later. Those who abandon biblical law for natural law are humanistic positive law theories. Always, always, always end up with some form of moral relativism. As they seek to impose order on society through the lens, the use of empiricism or, and or autonomous human reason. Without scripture as the foundation, autonomous man becomes the final arbiter of truth and meaning. And that always leads to statism. Where you've got somebody up there saying, well, I'm going to tell you what the truth is. Listen to me. Once transcendent absolute law is denied, the only law system available is essentially statist and imperialistic. That's why it is so dangerous in the world for Christians today. Because if the state wants to say, well, we believe sodomy is a great thing, we believe homosexuality is a wonderful thing, and if you say anything against it, we're going to put you in jail. Why can't they say, they can say that all they want? Because to them, law is arbitrary. Laws that are changing and arbitrary can be imposed on the population through propaganda, can only be imposed on the population through propaganda and coercion. Legislators and judges still appeal to truth, equity, and justice, but these terms are no longer valid in an order of flux and relativity. Okay, they're using Christian terminology. They're using old-fashioned terminology with new meanings. What is true and just today may become criminal, a criminal offense in 10 years. Now think about it. Homosexual behavior was considered a scandalous sin and a civil crime for almost 2,000 years in the Western nations. It was considered a disgusting perversion, and even in the 1960s, as late as the 1960s, homosexuals were rounded up and arrested and thrown in jail and fined and put in prison. Now it is protected by law, and those who speak out against it in a number of countries may be arrested for hate speech. And that's probably coming into the United States soon. <laughs> Consequently, as Rushdie writes, quote, neither positive law nor natural law can reflect more than the sin and apostasy of man. Revealed law is the need and privilege of Christian society. It is the only means whereby man can fulfill his creation mandate of exercising dominion under God. Apart from revealed law, man cannot claim to be under God, but only in rebellion against God. Once again, we see the importance of sola scriptura, we see the importance of scripture. The Bible teaches that the essence of sin is for man to attempt to be his own God, determining for himself what is good and what is evil. And this is seen in the fall of Adam and Eve. Eve decided that it was not prudent to simply accept what God had said about the forbidden fruit. She was deceived in, into thinking that the path of true wisdom and knowledge was to look at things apart from God's word and then decide for herself what was good and beneficial for her. That was the old temptation of the devil. Oh, you know, forget about what God said. Look at the tree, study it. Use empiricism. Instead of thinking God's thoughts after him and trusting in his word, she and her husband usurped the prerogatives of Jehovah, and they acted as the first secular humanists in history. <laughs> Professing Christians must learn from this first sin that the only way to have a Christian society is to trust God's word, lean not on our own fallen understanding, and work to implement the laws and principles found in the Bible alone. The Bible alone. Now, professing Christians who reject biblical law for natural law or subjective leadings of the Spirit, or a New Testament only purely personal ethic, or a baptized version of secular humanism, okay, Christian socialists, modernists, and neo evangelicals, all reveal that they really simply do not believe in sola scriptura. They don't have faith in the Bible. 
They don't like the Bible. They don't like biblical law. They're offended by it. But someone will object. You do not really believe that the Bible speaks to every area of life, do you? I mean, come on. It does not address drunk driving or heroin addiction, does it? Obviously, then, we must be able to look free to come up with our own ideas on such matters. Well, this is a common but a fallacious objection. When it comes to ethical matters, or the properly, proper godly way to live, personally and corporately, the teaching of God's word covers everything directly or indirectly. There are commandments that speak directly to certain matters. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, for example. And then there are areas that are covered by implication. Implication. For example, drunk driving is covered by laws dealing with manslaughter and the endangering of life and property. And I say to you that if we adopted biblical law with regard to drunk driving, drunk driving would be uh, much, much less practiced in America today. If you get drunk and you go out and you kill somebody in your car, you're put to death. That's what the Bible says, by implication. You have a couple of people executed for killing people in their cars, and people are going to be uh, much less likely to go out driving drunk. The doctrine of solo scripture as it relates to the civil magistrate is proved by a brief examination of the alternative. And I don't have time to get into this. What is the alternative to solo scriptura? And the only alternative to solo scriptura is statism. Statism. Now, obviously, there's different forms of statism. Some of them are, are, are nicer than others. Some of them are, have borrowed principles from Christianity and are better than others. But it's either the Bible or human autonomy. It's either the Bible or statism. So we'll continue this next week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that Jesus Christ is King and Lord over all due to his perfect sacrificial death and victory over sin, Satan, and death. We ask, Lord, that you would help us to understand your word regarding the kingship of Christ. And we ask you, Lord, that you would help us do our duty as Christians to be a salt and light to our surrounding culture, that we would work for a Christian civil magistrate. In Jesus' name, amen.